The gospel this morning comes from the gospel of Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they'd entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And, and all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west, the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Well, today's a special day. <clears throat> After today, nothing will ever be the same. I'm talking about the furniture arrangement, of course. <laughs> because, you know, when you came in here today, you were expecting one thing, were you not? At least something you knew you could rely on, that the furniture would be as it always has been. And now it's not. It's changed. And it's going to change our experience of this Sunday. And even if the chairs are put back in their old places, you will never be the same again for that experience, for that moment, for that change. Someone once said, you change one thing, you change everything. And so on this special day, as we celebrate the resurrection, we think back, we think back to just three days ago. Three days ago, and the world pronounced judgment on the gospel, on the good news, and on the bearer of that good news. Three days ago, the world put an end to its problem. It crucified Jesus. It put him in a grave, and it slammed a stone shut and hoped and expected that that would be the final word, that there'd be no more of this gospel nonsense. What had Jesus done? What had caused this moment to come about? You know, I've often said Jesus really didn't teach anything that wasn't already in the old scriptures. That he taught from the old scriptures. And that everything he taught us can be found in the old scriptures. Everything. So why was he so special? Why was he different? Of course, he made us look at it in a different way. And he still does. You know, in the very beginning of the, of the gospel, uh, we hear that the breath of God swept out over the waters and creation began. In the seven-day creation story, if you read it carefully, you will see that God does something rather peculiar. On one day, he creates light. And then three days later, he creates the source of light. Three days, that's kind of an interesting parallel. In other words, first, it's in the mind of God. And then it becomes reality in the world. And so God thinks mind, or light. And behold, there was light. And then he created the source of light. And that's what Jesus was teaching all along about the kingdom of God. That first, first you have to have the mind of God. You have to visualize the kingdom of God. And when you do, it can become reality. And what did he say this kingdom of God would be? What did he say right in the beginning of his ministry is, I have come to proclaim good news to the poor. What would be good news to the poor? You're going to die and go to heaven after living a long, miserable life? Or you're not going to be poor. God doesn't want you to be poor. Visualize that. And oh, you rich. You visualize it too. Imagine a world without poverty. Imagine a world without sickness. Imagine a world without bondage. Imagine a world 
where everyone had enough. Imagine it. Well, the powers and the systems of this world heard that message, and that was not good news. It was not good news indeed, because it meant they might have to give up something. They might have to give up what they had and what they had become accustomed to, what they thought was their, their right and their privilege. And when Jesus began to say, no, that's not why God gave you wealth. That's not why God gave you power. Do you suppose that God might have given you that for some other reason? To use that resource? Once had a fellow tell me, you know, I work harder and I work smarter. And that's why I'm successful. I said, amen. Now you work harder, that's your choice. But smarter is God's choice. Do you suppose God gave you the smarts to feather your nest or to help bring about the kingdom of God? We have to think about that because that requires us to change our way of thinking. It's not that having wealth is evil or bad or having power is evil or bad. They're both necessary, my friends. They're necessary to bring about the kingdom of God if properly used, if we're going to bring good news to the poor. But you know, that's nonsense to the world. And they had to put an end to it. They had to deal with it the way the world always deals when it is threatened, with violence. With violence. And so they put an end that day on the cross to ending the hunger, to ending the bondage, to ending the hope that there could ever be a kingdom of God on earth. They rolled that stone in front of that grave and they brushed it off their hands and said, no more of that nonsense. Let's get back the way things ought to be. But God blew that stone a mile high and he opened up that grave and he exposed the world for what it was. Empty. Empty. It did not lead to the kingdom of God. It just a hole in the ground. God overcame his own death and resurrected that day. Today, as we think about that, I think it's insufficient for us to think about it as something that happened 2,000 years ago and doesn't need to happen again. I think it needs to happen every moment of our lives, every day of our lives, and certainly on this Easter day. Can we look at the world differently? Can we imagine, can we use the creative powers that God gave us to imagine a world that has peace and justice, a world in which healing abounds, a world so full of resources, and yet a world where hunger exists, can we imagine eliminating hunger? And you know, we don't have to go very far. There are people right in this town who frequently go without meals, who have no access to health care, who have no access to education or a higher education or an appropriate technical education. Right here in Rowona, right in our town, perhaps right here in this congregation today. Can we imagine this town where no one went hungry, where every child had an opportunity to go to school and go as far as their gifts God gave them would take them? Can we imagine that? Because if we can't imagine it, we can't create it. But if we can imagine it, God will work with us to create it. If we truly believe that the powers and systems of this world cannot keep the gospel of Jesus Christ in the grave... If we truly believe that, then we join in that resurrection. We become the people of God. And we become the change agents for the salvation of our world. For the saving. Not for some time after death, but right now, right here. We end the hell on earth right now, right here. And we do it in this room right now, right here. By imagining that we can with God's help. This will be my last sermon to this congregation. I hope, for not, I hope not good news to all of you, but this will be the last time that I preach here. If I could leave one message, it would be to love God with all your being, to love mercy, to seek justice, to love neighbor, as self. Amen. Amen. Amen.